today we'll be hosting a capstone webinar. Each of these presentations features an ACHS student who has completed a final graduate capstone project. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Holistic Nutrition and Exercise, Information into Action, presented by ACHS graduate Shelley Cobb. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You may have noticed that your line has been muted. We are recording today's webinar and this helps ensure we can clearly hear our presenter. You'll also notice that you have a control panel at the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question for Shelley during the webinar, go ahead and type it into the questions box and she will answer them during the 10-minute Q&A session at the end of the webinar. I'm sorry, not the questions box, the comment box. <laughs> um, if you have further questions that require a bit more depth of answer, please feel free to follow up with Shelley directly at Shelley Cobb dot cnhp at yahoo.com and she's happy to respond to all of your questions but please be sure to give her some time to get back to you and now I'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to Shelly who will give a brief introduction and begin her lecture welcome Shelly well welcome everyone I'm so thankful that you guys signed up to hear what I've been studying about uh, just a little bit about myself um, five years ago I had a health crisis and I needed to uh, basically get healthy. My dad had uh, genetic heart issues and needed surgery and basically the cardiologist told me to either get well or be the next fatality. So if you notice up in the left hand corner of the screen that's me weighing 213 pounds. I had thrown a baby shower for my good friend who was nine months pregnant. I'm just overweight but she's nine months pregnant in that photo. And through an integrative medicine doctor I was able to reverse my health issues and lose 70 pounds and up here you'll see this is me with Leo that's my little grandson and these are all of our six wonderful kids and my dear husband we've been married will be 26 years next week and um, so that's a little bit about me back in the day when I was young before we had all of our children I taught high school and my bachelor's degree was in social science and I did my master's in education on teenage pregnancy so um, other than that, a few favorite hobbies is spending time with my family and friends, scrapbooking and jogging. And um, so that's a little bit about me. And I wanted to just say thank you so much to the college for letting me present. Um, this is really a special privilege. And also thank you to my family for letting me do my master's. Um, I'd like to go to the screen. There we go. Um, I'm not sure if any of you fully understand what complementary and alternative medicine is, so I just want to take a moment to explain that. I don't want to assume anything. So a CAM therapies or holistic health is to basically make man whole. We view the body as the being as one whole person, so physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Those are the different aspects of a person, and with holistic health, we treat the whole person, not just individual parts. And so over on the right hand of the screen, I listed the various modalities that are used through CAM. Um, today we're going to focus mostly on nutrition, exercise, and stress management. But as you can see, there's a variety of fields available. And you know, I've used several of them. I know they work really well. So just so that's a basic understanding of where my developmental model is going to come from. So my goal was to look at diet and nutrition and stress education um, to help reverse the ep obesity epidemic, um, to identify the different modifiable risk factors. Now, in the interest of 40 minutes, we're not going to tackle everyone, but we're going to hit highlights. Also, to present a need for nutrition education and physical activity, as well as use the construct of a developmental model. What's appropriate for age one is going to be different for what's appropriate for an 11 year old versus a 41 year old. So that's towards the end where I've developed curriculum. If you want the curriculum slides, because a lot of them I did cut for today's presentation, um, feel free to email me. Happy to send them to you. You know, If you're going to use them to bless others and educate others, go for it. Um, the objectives are to present curriculum for the nutrition and physical activity, provide different ideas to help reduce stress, and also provide recipes that are tasteful and healthy that individuals can enjoy. 
So with that, we'll get started. Um, obesity is on the rise. There's several factors involved. This is a construct that I created of just all different factors, personal beliefs, genetics, environment, food availability, dietary habits, hydration, stress, commuting, economics, single parenting, addiction, trauma, tragedy, uh, physical activity. So you can see there's several, and I'm sure there's even more that could be listed, but these are kind of the highlights of all the different contributing factors to obesity. The social science part of me comes out right here of uh, looking at the economics because it's not only just it's bad for your health, it's bad for the economy. Um, obesity, according to Dr. Dietz, costs an additional $150 billion a year for America just for the 10% of the national budget um, for medical expense. And what that really relates into is if you're overweight, that's an additional $266 spent on your health care in addition to just the regular standard of care that we all spend. An additional $1,700 if you're obese, which is the BMI greater than 30, or an additional $3,000 for those who are morbidly obese or BMI greater than 40. So not only is obesity a, a huge health issue, it's also a huge economic issue. So my goal today is to motivate you guys, help educate you, so we can try to turn this tide to not only get our nation healthy, but also get our economy healthy. Um, from 1987 to 2001, there was a 20% rise in cost due to obesity. And Finkelstein here noted that it wasn't the lap band surgery and the prescriptions and the obesity interventions to help reduce uh, obesity, but it was the co-founding factors and illnesses that obesity plays into that caused the 27% rise. So uh, with that, reforms need to be met on several levels, not just health care, but you know, you're know, you going to look at food deserts, you're going to look at society, you're going to look at personal issues, and so there's just a variety of things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, back in 1990, you'll, some of you may have already seen this slide. This is the obesity trends of U.S. Americans or adults. And, you know, 1990, less than no state had any adult population greater than 14% overweight. In 2000, looking at that, we had to jump up and add some new colors because now no state had a, an adult population less than 24% overweight. And now in 2010, which is our most current figures, the states here in the lower southern half, they are greater than 30% overweight. So as you can see, the obesity epidemic just keeps going on, keeps rising. So we need to do something about it. And not only is this just for adults, it's also showing up in our children. So. Some obesity facts, 68% of the U.S. adult population, and that's anybody 18 and older, is considered overweight or a BMI greater than 25. And your BMI is figured based on your height divided by meters squared, or your weight divided by meters squared. Um, and then 34% of the U.S. adult population is considered obese. And to be considered morbidly obese, that's greater than 40% or 40 BMI. So what that translates into is one in three, three adults are obese, one in three kids are overweight, and one in six kids are obese in preschool, and one in six children ages 2 to 17 have type 2 diabetes. So this is huge. This is a lot of health, poor health going on. Um, also, the CDC estimated that for those with severe obesity, nine years is taken off the person's life. So, you know, not only are we going to get shorter lives, we're going to be ill and pay a heavy burden for it. There is a, a phrase called double burden, where a lot of times people are like, well, you're just, you know, you ate too much. Eating too much doesn't mean that you're overnourished. 
you can also be malnourished. There's a lot of malnourished people that are overweight or obese, and so now they carry a double burden being not only are they overweight and that's ta taxing their system, but they're also malnourished and not providing enough for their system. So that's another factor to take into consideration. Um, overweight and obese adults, uh, CDC and several other studies show here's you know, common complications from being overweight or obese. Sleep apnea, lung disease, liver disease, cerebrovascular events, heart disease, diabetes, pancreatitis, gallstones, digestive issues, can certain cancers, uh, infertility issues, arthritis, inflamed veins, and gout. Now, if you look at that list and then compare it to the leading causes of death, they are very similar. It's not too shocking, you know, that they correlate, but, you know, other than accidents and HIV, pretty much everything else listed on the leading causes of death fall under those categories of complications of obesity. So looking at some trends, male obesity jumped from the prior reporting period to 2010 from 26 percent to 33 percent. That was considered a significant uh, difference. Male college graduates in general had the lowest percentage of obesity at 25%. However, if you were a non-Hispanic black or a male Mexican-American who did graduate college, they tended to have the highest rates of obesity. The theory there is now they're getting well paid, they might be commuting, they might be eating food in their car or eating like a king and not exercising because of the higher position jobs. So there's some social science in there as well. They're not sure why, but you know that was noted among the statistics. Um, males with some college had rates of obesity of 35%, and for the boys, it was highest among Mexican American boys at 24%. Now, looking at the women, um, the women increased from the prior reporting period, just 2.5%, that was not considered a significant difference. However, there is a population of ladies and girls we really want to take note of. The non-Hispanic black women had 51% rates of obesity, and their young girls had 22% rate of obesity. Um, for the women, that's a 10% higher rate than Mexican-American women, and 20% higher than non-Hispanic white women. Um, Statistics did show that women who completed college had a 13 to 16 percent lower rate of obesity than the other groups. And now this was interesting when I learned about this. For children, they had to look at head of household because kids don't work. And you know, so, looking at the head of household for kids whose parents completed college, they had a 15 percent less chance of obesity than those who did not complete high school. And the converse is true for girls whose head of household did not complete high school, the rate went up from 17% to 23%. So uh, you know, that's important to note. So education here obviously seems to be a factor in playing a part in lowering the obesity rates. And there are you know, some studies say, oh, you hear in the headlines, oh, but it's going down. There's little pockets where the rate did go down. Here, girls from went down from 11% to 7% um, whose head of household completed college. So we do see some little indication that there might be something working here, but we need to get a little bit more uh, aggressive with it. So childhood obesity, Rositer and Evans, Ever, Ever, sorry, uh, noted that when they studied obesity, childhood obesity, single moms were three times more likely to have obesity or obese children. And I just want to play play on that for a little bit. I'm not here to beat up any single mom. I worked um, as education director for six years at a pregnancy center. You guys do the best you can. We all love your kids. We want your kids to do well. I'm here to help, you know, support moms and help kids have a bright future. So, but what the statistics show and the research shows is 
it just goes back to maternal nutrition of if mom ate right and took care of her body. A lot of times single moms are young or they don't have access to good food or they don't eat well or you know, they're overweight. If there's a, a mother that's overweight when she's pregnant, it tends to trend into premature birth or slow, lower weight babies and slow d cognitive delays and such like that. And it just continues um, this awful cycle of, you know, if you started off in a negative uh, because mom didn't take care of her health and then she had a baby that was malnourished, a lot of single moms aren't able to stay home and breastfeed their babies and breastfeeding is inversely related to obesity. So here you've got a single mom, she's got a cute little one, but she needs to go back to work. She gives the baby formula, that's fine. But what Rosader and Evans Evers found out was a lot of times single moms introduced food too early. And so basically the baby wound up being malnourished because the baby's digestive system doesn't develop till a certain point. And so you can feed it food, but it may not process it right. And so here you just start this cascade of, of events where, you know, the baby's just starting in the negative and unless interventions come in and the child and mom get better nutrition, it's just going to result potentially, I'm not saying this is always, but potentially in, you know, slower school performance or athletic performance. And now they're going to grow up and that's going to be in a cycle. Um, so my heart goes out to the single, mo single moms. We need to help encourage them. We need to help educate them. And we need to help get them the right resources that they deserve. Um, obese children tend to have more severe risk later in life. It just follows logic that if you've been overweight ever since you were a little kid and you've carried that weight now into your 20s, 30s, 40s, that you've put a lot of damage and a lot of wear and tear on your system. And some of it may be irreversible. Um, so, you know, the longer a child's obese, the greater their risk of severe diseases are later in life. Um, childhood obesity is not based on BMI because those little darlings like to grow. So what they're based on is the sex-specific growth chart. So if, you know, you're a boy or you're a girl, the growth chart in the doctor's office, if you're in the 85th percentile for weight, then you're considered overweight. If you're in the 95th percentile, you're considered obese. If you're in the 120th percentile for weight, you're considered severely obese. Now, keep in mind, if height and weight match, you know, and then it's just a tall child, um, you know, that's one thing. But if their weight doesn't match their height and their weight is in the 85th, 95th, or 120th percentile, they have some weight issues going on. Um, childhood obesity is highly correlated to almost the same laundry list as adult obesity. You know, you get insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, low self-esteem and mental health issues. Um, I just was reading an article that by age 9, how you view yourself and what society teaches you really plays a huge factor in what you do later in life and how you perceive yourself and whether you want to achieve or not. So. You know, this is important. Kids are mean sometimes. Kids bully kids. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're providing a healthy lifestyle for these kids. Um, societal beliefs and behaviors, you know, these are another set of factors. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, each of these bullet points here could be its own presentation. But with that in mind, it's really important as a nutritionist or a holistic health practitioner to have a basic understanding of the various viewpoints, whether it's religious or societal beliefs. Um, some people are vegetarian for religious reasons. Some people are vegetarian for personal reasons or societal reasons. So making sure you're aware of 
those underlying reasons and being able to provide, all right, we need you to get protein, so if you're not going to eat protein you know, via animal product, then let's make sure you've got it over here so we can support within society and their cultural beliefs. Um, tradition, I, working as a nutritionist, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, but we always had such and such. So sometimes when you're changing people's food, they get a little funny. So finding alternative traditions is important um, that are going to be healthy and promote, you know, promote health and wellness. Um, so it's okay to sometimes bury a tradition and say goodbye to it, but you know, that's a topic for another day. Um, certain societies will view being overweight as a measure of wealth, luxury, or fertility. So being sensitive to that, um, I think it was the World Health Organization um, study I read where they talked about the different cultures. Certain African cultures view being overweight as a positive for fertility and health. So you might have a lady that comes into your office that's thin or that's overweight, but if her society says, you know, this is what beauty is, you're not going to persuade her to get super thin um, for health reasons. Her society, you know, she's not going to necessarily buy that construct. So helping her find what's a healthy weight that will still be pleasing for her and her society that she lives in is important. Um, commuting and drive through dining, those are some behaviors that contribute to obesity. I think this is kind of a no-brainer um, comment there, but it's been documented the more you drive, the greater chance of obesity goes up. And one of the studies I read that if you drove 16 minutes or longer, there was an exponential rate of you eating in your car, and then if you drove for an hour or longer to work or to school, then it increased your risk of obesity by 6% for each additional hour. So those are some things that we want to be aware of. You know, some things we can also fix, you know, try not to eat in your car. Um, economics, you know, they play a huge part in it. We've kind of mentioned a little bit of it. Low-income homes, college students oftentimes can't afford fresh fruit or produce or don't see the need for it and therefore, you know, buy the 10 cent top ramen, um, you know, you get you know, three dollars worth of it that lasts you all week. So, you know, we want to make sure that people understand the need for um, eating well. And food deserts, a lot of times in rural areas, this is a serious concern that's all across the U.S. as well as in other areas, other countries, is making sure that there is fresh produce and there is fresh meat available. Um, a lot of times in poor areas, grocery stores don't want to be there. So it's convenience store food. And well, convenience store food, they sell junk food. Um, two places you can jot down that if you wanted to look for uh, local farmers markets in your area is localharvest.org and um, farmfreshtoyou.com is an organic produce company that delivers to your door that they take out the middleman. So those are two places that can help um, address the issue of food desert. I would definitely try localharvest.com. might be localharvest.org. Um, but they will tell you where fresh farm food is available to near you. Um, school cafeterias. I know when my kids were little, they loved eating in the cafeteria. But oftentimes, that food is not the best, um, which can contribute to obesity. So it's really important if we can try to solicit our local school districts to improve their school cafeterias. That would be a wonderful way to help address this issue. Obesity, one of the biggest issues, one in six kids has type 2 diabetes. Um, several adults have it. I'm, not, I'm drawing a blank on the statistic for that, but um, 
looking at the complications of type 2 diabetes. You know, you have insulin resistance, heart disease, blindness, neuropathy, which is nerve pain or loss of uh, your nerves and typically the extremities, organ damage, stroke, tooth decay, oral hygiene issues, and kidney failure. So this is huge on, you know, little kids are now getting this. This is a lot of damage to the body and sometimes it's irreversible. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of our little ones and ourselves. Um, just so we don't have these horrible issues. Uh, cardiovascular disease, that's one of the major risks for obesity. You know, you just put that much weight on your body, you stress it out. It's the number one leading cause of death of uh, diseases of the heart. Uh, in 2013, they reported 611,000 deaths due to heart disease. So with that in mind, you know, it also plays into these other issues of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, overweight. So hopefully you're seeing now, you know, this is all interrelated. Uh, once again, diet and exercise are two of the main suggestions for reducing hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So we'll talk a little bit about diet and exercise in a sec. Um, stress reduction is huge. A lot of times people lifestyles are just stressful, uh, whether they're caring for a sick person or they have a high stress job or they're in school or, you know, whatever. Stress is a real thing. So teaching people how to reduce stress, when to get rid of certain things that are just not healthy um, can play a huge part in recovering one's health. Down here is a quote from Houston where he basically talks about, you know, it's a multimodal approach that not only do you need nutrition and vitamins and minerals, exercise, weight loss, you know, all of that. Um, these are all necessary key components to help reverse poor health and re reduce cardiovascular disease. So one of the main things that suffers that sometimes we don't think about is the brain. If we're not eating properly, the brain may suffer. So three main things your brain needs to stay healthy. Oxygen, um, a steady supply of the body's glucose. It uses about 20 to 25 percent. So thinking really does generate a need for calories, our glucose, and the brain needs stimulation. So the fastest way to grow old mentally is to just do nothing and don't eat right and not be active but we don't want to do that so we're going to look at some ways to help protect our brain uh, one of the most important things is to regulate it regulate the glucose when you have type 2 diabetes that messes with your blood sugar that messes with your body's ability to get glucose into the cell and so if you have type 2 diabetes or you're obese and you've got blood sugar issues or brain fog this is what's going on. Your brain's not getting a steady state of glucose that it needs. The brain is 60% cholesterol, so we want to make sure we're having a diet that is supplying us the essential fatty acids that's crucial for brain development. This is also applies during pregnancy especially. We want to make sure you're eating really well meals, that you're getting enough essential fatty acids, that you're getting enough vitamins and nutrients, um, is, you know, especially when your brain's developing and forming in utero. So uh, when proper diets are missing or proper nutrients are missing, that can also affect the brain. You know, there's studies after studies. I went to a brain chemistry seminar for the weekend a couple weekends ago and just amazing on how much food really affects the brain and how inflammatory conditions and autoimmune issues affect the brain. And so two key components that help reverse that are diet and exercise. By the end of this, you'll all be able to say diet and exercise help you um, and know why, hopefully a little bit more in detail. So, you know, looking at it, you want to help protect the brain, help reverse inflammation, neuroinflammation, 
and part of that is understanding the gut-brain axis. 70 to 80 percent, depending on who you read, um, your immune system is in your gut. Your gut creates several neurotransmitters, so if the gut barrier is broken or not effective or inflamed, it can send the wrong chemical messengers to the brain and affect the way the brain functions and what the brain tells the body to do, and vice versa. The blood-brain barrier is similar in construct to the GI membrane. So if one's broken down, there's a good chance that the other one's broken down. So some of the major offenders that cross the blood-brain barrier that can really cause damage, gluten, dairy, soy, corn, those have been the most highly modified foods and they just uh, wreak havoc. There's a thing known as gluten ataxia where people can't walk right because of ingesting gluten. Um, Alzheimer's is now being called type 3 diabetes. You can have Alzheimer's because of an insulin issue in the brain but not necessarily in the pancreas. So, you know, there's crazy stuff going on with the gut-brain axis. You want to make sure that that's healthy ways to check to see that if it's healthy is to have a, a fecal or a stool test done where it checks for inflammation, it checks the gut microbiota, and those are, those are oftentimes predictive of health outcomes. It'll let you know if the person has Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, celiac. It can also let you know if they have parasites and other bacteria or dysbiosis that needs to be put back in balance. Some ways to take care of that is going to be probiotics. Omega-3 and L-carnitine are recommended to help improve gut health. And I would also recommend, uh, not just because I have celiac, but I would just recommend it in, as a whole to remove gluten and dairy. They've, they just show so many studies that they just cause so much damage. It's really not worth it. Um, God bless you if you don't have celiac and can enjoy a regular slice of bread, but I would keep it in moderation. Um, food addiction, touching on you know, what gluten and dairy can do and sugar can do, is listed here that show constant exposure to high fat, high sugary foods can disrupt the balance and pathways in the brain, and they can act like drugs for certain people. So, you know, it's just highly recommended to eat. Uh, whole foods and encourage the veggies as much as you can. Um, childhood obesity interventions, we want to reach our young. Uh, this study took kids and divided them into three groups. One group did supplementation with lifestyle coaching and exercise. Another group just did diet and exercise. And the other one was a placebo group. And they found that the group that had the supplementation with the zinc, vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene, along with the lifestyle coaching, diet, and exercise, did better than the second group of just diet and exercise and coaching. So supplementation can help improve the risk. Zinc's been shown to help improve insulin sensitivity. And vitamin C and vitamin E those are some of your antioxidants, so that's going to help. Um, this group took another group of kids uh, for a month. They went to a camp, I believe on the weekends. They had their families come and they did group activities. But the main thing that I want to take away from this study was they asked these, uh, these obese kids, what are you going to do? And not only the child, but the family, they had them make SMART goals specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-based. And so, you know, they're asked, what is it you want to do? How are you going to do it? What are your resources you're going to do to need to accomplish it? And I feel like that's really smart as a holistic health practitioner is to, it's one thing for doctors to say, you just need to lose weight and go exercise. But give them the game plan, but don't give them your game plan, ask them for theirs. And so by doing this, this really helped turn the tide on the kids 
obesity, they were able to lose the weight, the families were able to do more. And so this is a really neat study to read about. Um, stress management. You see, you know, so many people are so stressed out, you know, whether it's perceived stress or a bear really running after you, that's real stress. Your body, if it thinks it's under stress, it's under stress. It's going to react the same. So we want to help bring the body back to homeostasis, which is the state of complete rest or calmness. You're going to think your best th that way. You know, um, stress is good. We need it at times. We need it. You know, if you see a bear, you better get running. So you want that to kick in when it needs to kick in, but you don't want to be at such a heightened, stressful state over every little thing because that just triggers a whole cascade of events of, you know, raises your cortisol, it causes weight gain, it's hard to sleep at night, and it messes up the circadian rhythm. So these are things that we want to bring back into balance because they also will play a factor in your health. Exercise, one of my favorite things to do, you know, make it a fun, sweaty activity. Um, whatever that is for you, you know, some people go, well, is sex, a f that's a fun, sweaty activity. Yes, it is. I'll let you decide if that's part of your exercise routine or not. But, you know, studies show that exercise can have positive effects on reducing hypertension, cardiovascular disease, cardio, um, cerebrovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and stress. Now, I will say with exercise, exercise is a stress. So if you are just starting out and you're, you know, haven't ran a mile in years, just start, just start walking. Do something light, do something easy, build up. If you go out exercising and you're wiped out the next day, two or three, you went out too hard. So back it down a bit and, you know, slowly increase it as your ability increases. Um, it's Exercise is always good for anyone. Um, one whole section in my paper was on Alzheimer's disease and dementia patients, and they took severe, moderate to severe dementia patients and added a physical activity, added exercise daily, and it decreased uh, or it increased their daily activity skills, and it decreased their need for um, being um, taken care of. So, although um, dementia can't be stopped, it can be slowed down, and exercise has been one of the ways that helps show that. Um, and then quickly here, the last few minutes I want to spend on uh, the fun stuff, the curriculum, and looking at what nutrition does and what's appropriate for the different stages. So kind of touched on it a little bit, preparing for pregnancy. You want to make sure you're starting to take your prenatal vitamins that are high in folic acid as that helps prevent neural tube defects. Iron, because once you get pregnant, you're going to be creating a lot more uh, blood volume for your pregnancy as well as for your body to sustain the pregnancy. So iron is key. If you take an iron supplement, it's best not to take it with green vegetables, but to take it with a vitamin C. Um, Calcium is going to be needed to help the baby grow. Uh, essential fatty acids, those are going to be needed for brain development. And um, please, please, please stop the alcohol and drugs and smoking if you are pregnant. Um, average weight gain for a healthy pregnancy is 25 to 35 pounds. And... Here's some different key nutrients. A uh, word of caution on seafood. It's good to have the essential fatty acids through seafood. Um, but you want to have no more than two servings a week, and one serving of seafood is three ounces. The risk for that is because of the mercury content in some of the fish. Um, delivery to 12 weeks postpartum. Enjoy that baby. Breastfeed if you can. Hormonal changes will happen. Your body is going to get back to normal. Um, but please, um, as I've seen this personally in certain people's lives, 
If you have postpartum depression, please tell your provider, please tell someone, please get help. Um, we need a healthy mom, we need a healthy baby. Um, also, physical exercise after having a baby. I don't know too many mothers that wanted to go exercise after having a baby, but take it easy. It's okay to walk, but make somebody push the stroller. You don't want to vacuum or sweep or mop or drive the first six weeks if you can, because that by doing that, those muscles are getting back into shape and you can cause a prolapse uterus or a prolapse bladder if you um, start doing too much activity too soon. Uh, you want to make sure if you're nursing that you're drinking plenty of water. You increase additional 500 calories a day for nursing, so make sure you're eating well. The interesting fact is ba breastfed babies typically like a more variety of foods than bottle-fed babies. It's best if you can breastfeed. I'm not here to put anybody on any guilt trip. I wasn't able to breastfeed my first for health reasons. So if you have health reasons, whether you're ill or um, just can't, don't worry. There's really great quality formula that's available. Um, this also, bottle feeding helps other people be involved and can bond with the baby. Um, first foods, giving baby food. That's always fun, it's always messy, but you want to wait till they're at least six months of age and can sit upright, and first foods to start on are going to be rice, cereal, and vegetables, and some fruits. Um, because it's natural tendency to like sweet food better, um, offer the rice cereals or the oatmeal, the grains first, and then the vegetables so they get a taste for the savory flavors. Uh, this is really key. Size matters when you're feeding a baby. If you look at that sweet little baby's hand, size of its stomach is the size of its fist, and the size of its pinky is the size of its throat. That's why it's important to have it pureed and you know soft and palatable for them. Uh, three to five year olds, they should be able to eat what we do. Um, small portions. It's always good good idea to start small, let them come back for a second portion. That's been shown to help curb obesity. Um, three bites, three choices. Little kids like to have a say in what they eat. So if you can provide a variety of healthy foods for them to choose from, let them do it. Chances are they'll eat it. Um, if they're not hungry, don't make a fight about it. Don't sit and make them eat it till it's all gone. Just understand that kids go through weird growth spurts. They're going to eat at different times but just make it available. Um, exercise is key for kids. Really, at, from zero to two, there are no exercise standards. Little kids are busy all the time anyways. Um, once they hit school age, now they can start doing you know, up to 30 minutes to 60 minutes of exercise the older they get. Um, not only is it just good for their health, it helps with coordination, spatial reasoning, flexibility, it helps maintain weight, and it enhances learning. So two things that are known to activate the brain at both time and simultaneously is going to be exercise and music. Um, your six to ten year olds, this gets into a tricky age group. Because development slows down from six to ten, they may not eat hardly any at all and then all of a sudden just be ravenous and eat for like three days and out eat the whole grocery store. Don't be surprised by that and don't be upset if they just don't eat a lot because they're going to eat what their body needs. Um, this age too, when they figure out that the hamburger on their plate came from a cow, they may very well wind up being a vegetarian for a little bit because it bothers them that it came from an animal. Typically it's short-lived, but if it can last a little bit longer, don't be upset by that. And the way to, because moms are like, well, what do I feed them if they don't eat that? Just provide a variety of foods for them to eat. Um, electrolyte drinks, save your money. You don't need bottled electrolyte drinks. Get 32 ounces of water, put four tablespoons of lemon juice in it, a teaspoon of sea salt, and a tablespoon of honey, preferably manuka honey. Mix it in and there's your electrolyte drink. If you don't even want to go to the hassle of making that, um, coconut water provides a lot of electrolytes. 
that the bottled um, electrolyte drinks have, but it's minus the food coloring and the artificial flavorings. Um, teenage to adult nutrition, we're going to want to make sure we're eating a wide variety of foods, which is what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics recommends. Um, best way to reduce chronic disease is to eat a wide variety. And once again, what we need, uh, water, oxygen, and nutrients, you know, so the acronym ONE. So we can live for 40 days without food, a few days without water, but only minutes without air. So we want to make sure we're providing our body with everything that it needs. Um, some people like to ask, they like statistics, and see what it looks like in reality. So for the nutrients, you want 10 to 35 percent protein, 20 to 35 percent lipids or fats, and 45 to 65 percent carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are going to be your fruits and your vegetables, not just french fries and corn and pasta, but you want to make sure you're getting in, you know, kale and fresh fruit and um, green beans and those other foods as well. Um, Color, variety, and texture is the spice of life, as my girlfriend likes to say. Your plate should exhibit that, too. So if you're eating a wide variety, you're going to get a wide variety of phytonutrients, or vitamins and nutrients. It's best if it's organic, um, just to eliminate the cofactors of toxins and chemicals and fertilizers. So I'm going to skip these really quick. Um, this page just as a summary of what an average plate should look like per meal. You know, because we're trying to curb the obesity epidemic, fruit stays on the first part of the day. Um, on the right hand side, if you see, you know, one to two cups of vegetables, three to four ounces of protein, and one piece of fruit, that should be a sufficient meal. You want to eat till you're satisfied, not eat till you're stuffed. Make sure you're drinking plenty of water. A lot of times people mistake the thirst mechanism for hunger. When in doubt, drink a glass of water and 15 minutes later, if you're still hungry, have another glass of water. Um, basic equation for exercise, the American Academy of Sports Medicine recommends for adults, you know, 18 or older, to do 30 minutes of some type of moderate activity a day or 90 minutes of high intensity activity a week. So it's also recommended to do 10,000 steps. You can buy a little pedometer that will tell you that. Um, if you have joint issues, the rebounder is a great way to um, take stress off your joints and work, work out on that. And it's kind of like the lone guide. It wasn't worth having a slide for, but it's important to note. Dry brushing is a way to also stimulate the lymphatic system. You can use a natural bristle brush. Do it all over your body before you take your shower, and that just helps stimulate your circulation. Um, fun ways to exercise. It doesn't have to be a recreational sport. It doesn't have to be a team sport. Um, you know, found the cute picture of Grandpa hula hooping. So hula hooping, jump rope, hiking, walking, dancing. If you're not able because of injury or illness, you're bedridden. There's activities you can do in your bed. You can, you know do weights, do bicep curls and tricep kickbacks and overhead press. And, you know, you don't need to buy expensive weight equipment. You can use bottled water. You can take empty cans or empty bottles, fill them up with rice or beans, use those as weights. Um, so there's plenty of fun ways to exercise. I actually Googled fun ways to exercise and like within a second I got probably a thousand hits of try these crazy ways. Um, Geocaching, if you're wondering what that is, that's scavenger hunting using the coordinates of a map. You go find little hidden treasures and oftentimes you replace, you put something new for somebody else to find. It, but it's kind of an adult scavenger hunt and it typically requires walking or hiking. Um, other ways to stay young, I mean this is your best bet on reversing obesity and all the cofactors and comorbidities. You know, play with kids. If you want to be around some of the funnest people, be around children. They've got really bright ideas. Um, 
volunteer your time, volunteer your talents, garden, bike to work, um, crafting or hobbies or sewing. You know, those all keep the body active and also can, especially hobbies, that's another natural stress reducer. If you're doing a hobby that you enjoy, that uh, calms the body down too. Playing card games and board games, and most importantly too, get a good night's sleep. Um, and finally, my last slide is just various ways to relax, ways to decrease stress. Um, meditation or prayer, journaling. Um, my sweet little granny, she likes to do a grateful list of what she's grateful for at the end of each day. Cognitive restructuring, that's looking at positive affirmations of looking at the basically the bright side of a bad, bad situation. Of what, what's the takeaway? What can I learn from this? What can I improve from it? Um, rather than let the stress drag you down. You know, the, the phrase, make lemon, when given lemons, make lemonade. Diet and exercise we talked about. Um, those are great ways. There are several deep breathing exercises. One that I like to do is progressive muscle relaxation where you go through from the top of your head through your toes and you learn to contract your muscles at 100% and 50% and 5%. And you're just training your body to recognize when it's stressed. So when you start feeling stressed, you can start doing the deep breathing exercises that help calm your body down. Um, music and art and therapy, those are fun ways. Um, I had a sweet little girl. I told her I would show you guys the picture that she drew of me. Um, you know, art therapy is a fun way for self-expression. It can help strengthen the ego and um, just allow for an outlet. So, to sum it all up, we want to provide our clients with education. We want to support them in their society that they live in, we want to be sensitive to their needs, but also give them you know, really great answers of why it's important to eat healthy, why it's important to have organic food, why it's important to sleep right. Um, you know, and I've been reading the phrase, you know, aging is expected, getting old is optional. And so this is, you know, I don't mind getting, I don't mind aging, but I don't want to be old. I want to stay young, and I hope that you guys do, do too, and I hope that you can share this with others and encourage others to have a fun, active life and get their health back. And so if you guys have any questions or if you want to contact me, um, there's my email and my phone number. I'm more than happy to chat with you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Shelly. That was great and a lot of really good information and uh, statistics and facts um, that I feel a lot of people will be able to go home with. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat box. Um, okay. So, well, the first is actually more of a comment from Lisa, and she said, um, baby lead weaning, and L uh, lead is spelled L-E-D, um, is a good book for first foods, but it promotes a different path of first foods. So that might be a book um, people might want to check out, possibly. Um, okay. And then another, we had a question from Judy, and she would like to know, is there such a thing as alkaline coffee? That is coffee with herbs in it. You know, I don't drink coffee. I, that would be a great question to look up. I know I for those that can't have coffee, I've recommended um, roasted dandelion root mm, that is a good one as a coffee alternative but I have not heard of the alkaline coffee great and then Samantha she just had a comment she said loved it would love to get the slides from you and Samantha we will be sending her okay. the video and the slides so um, you can keep an eye out for that okay uh, we have another comment that says thank you so much Shelly this is great and perfect to start the year Oh, you're welcome. If anybody else has any questions, go ahead and uh, pop those in. Oh, we have a couple more coming in. Coconut. Okay, we have one from Mona, um, a comment. Coconut water lacks sodium, so if that is used to replenish electrolytes, sea salt should be added. Thanks. Okay. Um, Tanya says this was wonderful. Thank you. 
And then Christina has a question. She would like to know, are you familiar with, um, glute, I think she means gluten-free um, CF, I'm not sure what that means, ADHD diet. So that's, uh, she wrote it out, GF slash CF ADHD diet. Um, I don't know if she's referring to the GAPS diet. That might, I know the GAPS diet addresses the ADHD component. I'm not sure what CF stands for. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, typically with somebody with ADHD, um, gluten and dairy should be removed. Mm -hmm. and corn's always a good one to remove because it's highly modified. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the GAPS diet you could check out. There's also the book, The Second Brain. Mm. Um, that addresses it as well. That's great. Um, oh, she she had a, a clarification. Casein free, C A S E I. Oh yeah. 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 Casein's a protein found in dairy, mm -hmm. and being that you can't um, separate casein out of the dairy product, um, casein can uh, mimic gluten. It's called molecular mimicry. Mm. And so, um, da all dairy. Uh, corn, rice, trying to think, yeast, millet, um, oats can be cross contaminated with mm -hmm. gluten. This is something we talk about almost every day at work. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm um, sure. yeah. All, all of those can, for certain individuals, mimic gluten. Mm -hmm. And so you might remove gluten, you know, wheat, rye, and barley. And be like, well, they improved some, but they're still having certain issues. It might be that if they're still having dairy, corn, rice, yeast, millet, or oats, those could be acting for that person's body mm -hmm. as gluten and causing the same reaction. Um, you can find out on a food sensitivity panel, an IgA or IgG uh, food sensitivity test. That'll let you know how the body responds. Um, if you see an integrative health doctor, they should know about it. Great. We have a, one, a couple more questions. Um, okay. Connie wants to know, what was the websites for the foods that can be delivered to home and then the website for a local harvest site? Um, localharvest.com, I believe, and um, Farm Fresh to You. Oh, great. Yeah, and I, I believe there are, um, depending on where you live, there are quite a few services that um, can deliver to home. I know, for example, here in Portland, um, there is Amazon Prime delivers new seasons, which is okay. like a Whole Foods, so that could also be an option as well. If yeah, and there's like also, <laughs> um, right, and there's also Thrive Market online. Yeah. I've not used them, but I know there's other people that do. That might yeah. be part of the Amazon Prime. Yeah, there are a couple options out there now that we're getting into a more technological world. <laughs> well, yeah, and then also to encourage you to ask your local grocer, because mm -hmm. down here I went to Ralph's, and they didn't, I mean, my whole family has celiac, so I was looking for a gluten-free product, and he was like, no, we don't carry it. I said, oh, that's okay, I'll just go to you know, the natural market and get it. And he goes, no, you won't. We'll order it for you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and, well, they want your business. And right. So, you know, that's if, good. If you ask for it, they'll, they're more than happy to accommodate. <laughs> for sure. Um, and we do have a question about when the slides and, and recording will be made available. And that will that email will go out, everybody, in about um, one to two weeks. Okay, perfect. And I think that is all the questions. We have a couple more thank yous, and everybody really yeah. enjoyed the presentation. Um, Very yeah, thankful to so, hear that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so that's about all the time that we have today, but I want to thank you so much, Shelly, for sharing your very hard work that um, you presented in class for us. And this is really a lot of great information and really important information for our future. So thank you very much. Um, and if everybody, you so oh, you're welcome. And if everybody enjoyed the content of today's webinar, you might also be interested in our, in the graduate program that um, Shelly was in. You can check it out at achs.edu and it's the Master of Science in Holistic Nutrition. 
And the mission of the MS in Holistic Nutrition degree program is to provide professional holistic nutrition and physical health recommendations from which community programming and client education can be based. This in turn will help people to live healthier lives, prevent illness or injury, and reduce the risk of chronic disease while promoting wellness. You can find, like I said, you can find more info on this program and other holistic health programs online at achs.edu. Um, and again, if you have any further follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Shelly at shellycobb.cnhp at yahoo.com, and we'll go ahead and post that in the chat, and I think it's up on your screen right now. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for attending our webinar, and thank you, Shelly, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.